it being 12.15, we'll make a start. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Senate Occasional Lecture, the second in our series for 2021. My name is Tony Matulik. I'm the Clerk Assistant Committees in the Department of the Senate. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Today's lecture is Auslan interpreted. It's also being live streamed on the Australian Parliament House website. So a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us here in the theatre at Australian Parliament House and for those of you who are viewing online. COVID safe arrangements are in place for this event. We are grateful if you could maintain COVID safe practices during your visit. It's my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Moulds to present today's lecture. Dr. Moulds is Senior Lecturer in Law at the University of South Australia, and Sarah is co-founder of the Rights Resource Network, South Australia. Dr. Moulds has a particular interest in lawmaking and the role of parliamentary committees in rights protection in, South, in, in Australia. Her PhD thesis on this topic was awarded to the University of Adelaide Doctoral Medal in 2018 and was recently published in book form by Springer. Sarah is an executive member of the International Parliamentary Engagement Network and the Australasian Parliamentary Studies Group. Dr Moulds is very committed to connecting parliamentary officers, scholars, the community and lawmakers to strengthen our parliamentary institutions. In our lecture today, Dr Moulds will draw on her research to propose a model for evaluating the work of parliamentary committees and their, impacting, their impact on legislation and lawmaking. Sarah will give particular attention to the role that parliamentary committees play in facilitating public engagement in the lawmaking process. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr Maltz. Thank you so much, Tony. And it's a real privilege to be here with you today in this beautiful city and this very special place and talking to you, the most important and fascinating people in our parliamentary democracy and the focus of my research. Today, I want to talk about two ideas and I'm sure they're pretty obvious to you, but I'm keen to see if I can give some practical ideas on how we might draw bigger public attention to these two ideas. The first one is that parliamentary committees are important and they're having an impact on lawmaking in Australia. The second is that parliamentary committees are central to improving the deliberative quality of lawmaking in Australia. I've got a written paper that might be particularly useful for those of you who are working in Parliament at the moment and perhaps intimately involved in supporting parliamentary committees. So could you give me a little wave if that's you, just so I know my audience? Okay, so the paper will be available after this and I've also published um, articles on each of the case studies you'll hear me talk about today. I'll be galloping through the research, but that paper has more detail, including some more specific recommendations that might be useful to you. And I'm actively involved in research in this space still. So my favourite thing is talking to people like you, and I'd love to explore that further with you. So um, give me a little wave if you've maybe worked for the public service before. Okay, excellent, wonderful. Um, you're also so important and fascinating for me in my research. And in my PhD research, I talked to lots of public servants about um, their experiences of engaging with parliamentary committees and supporting those committees. And again, I'd love to hear feedback from you on this approach. Um, and a little wave if you're maybe from the non-government sector. Okay. Again, thank you for coming here and, and being part of this. I'm hoping the, the second part of this lecture on the way that the parliament might engage with community might be particularly relevant to you. Um, and I think that um, it'll be great to think about how we can elevate your voices in this conversation about parliamentary committees. I'm conscious therefore that you are the experts and I'm the curious observer. Um, so um, I hope I don't 
come across as telling you how to suck eggs. I deeply admire your work. Um, my goal is to take the fascinating, great, excellent things that you're doing and share that more broadly um, with the rest of the community who are interested in being part of this democratic conversation with you. So why do I care about parliamentary committees? One reason is that I've, um, my career so far has revolved around the parliament. I've worked for a senator myself. I've worked for government at the federal and state level. I've worked um, in law reform bodies and now in academia. I teach legislation. I teach parliamentary lawmaking. And at every point, parliamentary committees are a standout part of this. Um, so that's why this lecture is about how we might evaluate the impact of parliamentary committees on lawmaking. And it's important for me to stress that I'm interested in case studies that talk about lawmaking, but I'm very conscious that committees do so much more than that. And some of my research tries to speak more broadly to those other functions of committees, and I'll hopefully draw that out in the lecture as well. Why might other people care about parliamentary committees? Well, the international community is interested in Australian parliamentary committees for a number of reasons. If we think about the federal parliament, one of those reasons is we don't have a constitutional bill of rights here, as you well know. Instead, we rely heavily on parliamentary committees and we have a deeply entrenched idea of parliamentary sovereignty. Parliament is the place that we want to see the tricky things sorted out, not the courts. So that makes the work of Parliament really deeply entrenched in our democratic culture here and of interest to the rest of the world. We're heavily dependent on this process of parliamentary scrutiny for rights protection. And I think that's possible to identify a really direct and significant and deep impact on the content of the law which makes parliamentary committees of interest to lawyers. My work also gives me hope and optimism that parliamentary committees might be a site of investment for addressing a deficit in trust and connection with our public institutions in our democracy. So there's a potential role there in my view for parliamentary committees playing a central role in reconnecting our community to the parliament and enhancing our um, democracy through deliberative processes. And this goal has motivated me even more since I started teaching because my students, my law students, um, who come and do foundations of law or learn about um, statutory interpretation, they have a sense of disconnect and distrust and dissatisfaction with democracy. And these are people that are actively looking to learn about law. So it's imperative that people like us who are proud of this institution find a way to communicate all of the good things about it outwards to those people who are currently feeling excluded from the process. That is our obligation as people who have had the privilege and opportunity to understand how this institution works. So if we all agree that parliamentary committees are pretty interesting, and maybe not everyone in the world does, but hopefully most of us here do, the hard part is how do we evaluate their work or their impact? And many scholars have said, look, trying to kind of draw a causal link between something that happens in a bit of parliament with an outcome over here, it's just inherently fraught. It's very difficult to do. There's political actors all the time. The, the bodies are changing, the landscape's changing. It's hard to do empirical work. And I agree that that's true. And I agree that the parliamentary committees, any individual body in parliament, can have a range of dynamic fluid attributes, sometimes in tension with each other. But I think we have to try to understand what the impact is because that's the only way we can work out where to invest more time and energy and resources towards this broader goal of improving democratic engagement with the parliament. So I have tried to develop a framework that I'm really interested in your feedback on, that I'm hoping will help academics to reflect on the value of parliamentary committees. Um, 
I'm hoping it will help community organisations to tell their members and their boards why working with committees is important. And I'm hoping it might help you that are working as public servants or parliamentary staff explain to your bosses why this should be part of your job description, why you should um, be uh, praised for doing it well, why we might want to put more resources in different parts and why we might want to actively recruit people with the skills that um, will help enhance um, the impact and role of parliamentary committees. So my evaluation framework um, has these different pillars. Um, the first one is if we're going to try and evaluate the work of a parliamentary committee, we have to understand the institutional context. So a federal parliamentary committee is very different to something in South Australia or in New Zealand. A Senate committee is very different to a House committee or a Joint committee. We all know the reasons why but also understanding some of the cultural influences, including common law ideas, and also the idea of the Senate as being the house of review. Because these features of our system bring legitimacy to the work of committees, but they can also tell us why things might be difficult to change. The second pillar is about understanding that committees have different functions. So some of the Senate standing committees, as you well know, um, are doing um, estimates work as well as legislative scrutiny work. And that this creates a particular dynamic within the committee and we need to be aware of that. In the same way that the scrutiny of bills committee rarely involves public inquiries, but is having a big output in terms of reports these are some of the things we have to take into account when evaluating them. Then the harder parts are around the idea of diversity of participation and legitimacy. So um, it's possible to look at a committee and say, how diverse was the participation in that committee? Um, who's an active participant and who's not being part of it? And when we know who's actively participating, we should be interested in whether they think it's legitimate or not. Do the members think this committee is legitimate? Do the submission makers take it seriously? Does the media care what they say? These are questions that are important to build into evaluation um, of committees. And then the data comes in, if you like, with the, the last part here, legislative impact, public impact and hidden impact. So in the past, people looking at committees have said, well, it's, uh, we wanna see if they've made any impact on the law itself. The way we do that is to say, it was introduced looking like this, it was enacted looking like this, these things changed and can be attributed to the committee. Or similar with estimates, you know, they asked this question, they got this response and this was the outcome. That's beautiful, but it doesn't tell the whole story. So I did that work in my um, PhD and my case studies, but it doesn't tell us the whole story because of the time frame that that involves um, looking really quickly at impact, but also it doesn't tell us what the committee might have done around public discourse on the law and the hidden impact it might be having on the work of people like you in the future. So if we say the committee failed because none of its recommendations were enacted, I think we're missing something because the committee might have had an impact on the way that the public and the way that the parliament talks about the issue so that next time a bill is introduced, that committee's influence is actually very strong because they've identified the alternative legislative option, they've created the space for people to change their mind and they'll pave the way for a future reform. And we won't see that if we just focus on legislative impact. Hidden impact is um, where we're able to ask public servants, parliamentary committee staff and community organisations whether they change their behaviour as a result of the experience of dealing with a public uh, parliamentary committee. And um, 
this is where the boring things count. So if you have a look at the legislation handbook, you can see that it's strongly influenced by the ideas and criteria that the scrutiny of bills committee are applying. If you're going to the Office of Parliamentary Council and um, getting their assistance to draft a bill, they will be anticipating the scrutiny that might come from committees and helping you to clarify your instructions um, for your um, department and your minister around the design of the law. So in that way, the committee's work is having this hidden influence on the way that laws are developed and it actually can be quite powerful. And I'll give some examples of this. So the um, case studies from my research um, are on the slide here. The counterterrorism case study is the uh, one that's reflected in the book of my PhD and the other um, case studies I'm still working on. Um, and I'm really open for ideas on what the case studies might be um, to to kind of test um, that evaluation framework that I discussed. So if we just have a look at some of the results of this evaluation process, um, I hope to give you an idea of how important your work is and where we might look to make um, further investments. Uh, so the idea of looking at institutional landscapes is important if we're doing any kind of comparison so the Westminster Foundation for Democracy asked me to do a presentation about how COVID-19 committees might have been working to scrutinise executive action in response to the pandemic. And if we're going to look at that um, question, we have to understand that they come from very different institutional landscapes. It also becomes apparent that the scope of the committee's powers and functions is going to directly influence things like who's going to participate, how legitimate they see the process and the potential for a legislative impact. So these things um, as, uh, need to be balanced together with other components of the system um, if we're going to think about making this type of scrutiny effective. And so we see that the Australian Committee really broad terms of reference to look at COVID-19 response, not just legislation, attracted a really diverse range of people to the inquiry, high rates of participation. But, you know, questions over legitimacy because of the opposition chair and also perhaps the relationship with executive agencies was not quite as strong. We then see other examples from New Zealand where we have this really tight relationship um, between the um, executive and the committee, um, but we see that their committee ceased pretty quickly. So in both cases, the community are looking for the committee to hold the executive to account. That's really important. The way we design the committee's functions and powers has an impact on who participates. Um, and we have to understand that institutional con um, context if we're going to evaluate the committees. Um, and this slide is another iteration of that same point. If we're thinking about um, legislative impact, the counterterrorism case study is really interesting to me because on the one hand, many people, including me when I was working at the Law Council where I worked for 10 years, was so frustrated. All the time we're putting work in to submissions to committees and nothing is happening. They're not listening to us. And we've got this human rights committee that's trying so hard to talk about international standards. We've got the scrutiny of bills committee working its guts out to point to issues with the law and nothing's happening. But actually, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security that openly is not interested in human rights, it's interested in effective national security legislation, becomes the unsung rights protection hero in this story. And this is important for us to reflect on why that might be. It's because that committee was part of a system that enabled the right kind of opportunities for people to change their mind in a safe space. And to 
kind of rub off some of the rough edges of the um, counterterrorism law in terms of rights <laughs> protection. So I stop here and say none of this makes our counterterrorism laws compliant with international standards. None of it is this, uh, as strong as a Charter or Bill of Rights. But on the other hand, something pretty special is happening in Australia where our counterterrorism laws have a rights enhancing experience through a committee that's got nothing to do with rights. And my research suggests this committee tells us something valuable. It is the safe space that this committee creates between the members and the executive agencies that allows them to workshop alternative options that will maintain the government's objective, but in a less rights intrusive way that allows it to have this impact. So that's why it's able to have 100% strike rate um, in terms of turning its recommendations into legislative amendments, even in the context of counter-terrorism and its tightly controlled membership. This example also shows why looking only at legislative impact is not good enough because the scrutiny of Bill's committee that was involved in looking at all of these laws too, in my view, also deserves credit for all of the rights enhancing changes that were made to these laws because it's the scrutiny of Bill's committee's work that allowed the submission makers to draw clear attention to the issues in a way that would resonate with the members of that committee. The scrutiny of Bill's committee gave everybody else the language, the, the, the accepted culturally safe language to talk about these laws and that became important um, in the changes that we saw. The Legal Constitutional Affairs Committee, that's the LCA committee in this table, you can see that sometimes they didn't have a very good strike rate but they were central to the changes we saw um, in the laws in counterterrorism, And that reason is they enabled um, a broader level of participation in the public debate, which again creates a safe space for parliamentarians, for backbenchers to shift their position behind amendments that results in legislative change. So again, I emphasise, I'm not suggesting committees alone are good enough for rights protection, but I am saying they're having a rights enhancing impact. And sometimes it's the committees we least expect that are having the biggest direct legislative impact. And the reason they can do that is they're supported by other committees in the system. Now, the Intelligence and Security Committee has been criticised on the grounds of being too close to the executive and not deliberative enough, not reaching out to Muslim communities, for example, that might be directly impacted by that committee. So that again tells us that high legitimacy among the department, low legitimacy among the community, it's an issue we should care about. That's, in my view, the way that we care about that is to make sure we've got different forums in a system working together. So the next tier of the evaluation framework is around public impact. And this allows us to tr transcend this kind of forced causal relationship between a recommendation and a legislative impact. Because as you would all know, often the committees are not even doing that anyway. <laughs> They're not suggesting a precise amendment. They're suggesting an idea change or a policy position change. And this work of parliamentary committees is really powerful when you step back a moment and look beyond just the immediate parliamentary debate period for an individual law and think more broadly about how we talk about um, lawmaking. So I looked at all of the Hansard debates on both of these case studies. Um, and we see that the work of parliamentary committees is really important in the way that other parliamentarians talk about the law. And you might say, well, of course, these MPs are on the committee, they've heard it, they want to spook their own involvement. You'd expect them to say the committee recommended that, you'd expect them to support it if it was government controlled, you'd expect the opposition to support it if it was opposition controlled. Of course, but something deeper is happening the language 
of scrutiny is infiltrating the debate in a more sophisticated way, in my view. So when we look at the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, many scholars have said this has been a kind of failure when it comes to rights protection. Um, they don't have much teeth. They can write a report often, it's tabled too late. Um, we don't see a, a genuine commitment to international human rights standards in the discourse in Parliament. And I'd agree with that. But we do see other powerful shifts happening, including a con the concept of proportionality that comes through in the language when we're balancing public interests, that tells us that that idea resonates across political lines. We definitely see the idea of parliamentary accountability coming out of that scrutiny of Bill's language in the debates. And in the marriage equality example, I argue that parliamentary committees are the unsung heroes of that reform. Many people would say it was the plebiscite postal survey um, that was the catalyst for marriage equality reform. I would argue that it was the 10 years of parliamentary committee work that happened before that that provided that basis. And that was because in those committees that many people who, including myself, were appearing before and saying this is a disaster. This is a Hanson Young run committee. No one's gonna take any notice of it. The, the politics are entrenched. We're never gonna get change. But in those committees, the stories were told. People were able to talk about their brothers and sisters, their parents, and they were able to connect in a real way to some parliamentarians who started to think about things in a different way. The committees also got expert legal advice from groups like the Law Council, expert other advice from groups around that look, look at the interests of the child, and were able to formulate legislative options that included things like exceptions for people with religious beliefs. So by the time the next committee comes along, by the time the private members are looking to put their bills together, they've got these options identified from the committee work. The MPs are starting to set, get a sense from their electorate. The form letters that come in that feel like a waste of time for the committee staff to deal with because they've got like 473 form letters, those things matter because they suggest that a shift is happening in the community and they create the right space for an MP to say in their party room, can we rethink this? So those impacts are not visible by just looking at recommendations being enacted. The other aspect of my evaluation framework is around hidden impact, and that is to uncover the extent to which parliamentary committee work is influencing the way that new laws are developed and drafted. And I think this is really exciting, interesting area, and it's definitely something that sets Australia apart because we see in the, what my students might describe, boring things like the legislation handbook, the guide to framing criminal offences, the drafting directions, um, the annual reports of the committee, we're getting little nuggets of gold that are being used by public servants, by parliamentary council, and by minister uh, advisory teams to develop new laws. Um, and they are the little examples of how you might put a safeguard in to protect against privacy impact. They're the little things that you might do to ensure that you've got your burden of proof right in a um, preparatory offence, for example. Um, they're the type of factors that you might want to include in the explanatory memorandum to kind of um, anticipate the type of scrutiny you might get as it moves through to a Senate committee. And these things um, can be really influential in the design of legislation and an opportunity for us to think about what values we want to um, ensure are built into our lawmaking process. And the values that come from the Scrutiny of Bills Committee are definitely most evident in these materials. So then again, we might say Scrutiny of Bills Committee, most people haven't heard of it. 
most community organisations don't use that as their focus. They're going for the Senate Select Committee where the media is, but the scrutiny of Bill's committee work and their language is powerful. And when the community organisation uses that language, their submissions resonate across a broader audience. That language also features in the structure of many parliamentary committee reports. Um, and so we start to build up a body of work around ideas like privacy that give us a big understanding of what our concept in Australia of these rights ideas is. And it's influenced by international law, but it's something deeper about our parliamentary culture. So um, I want to get on to engagement, so I'll run through these key findings and I think this slide's a bit wobbly in presentation, I'm sorry about that. Um, what are the key findings? Parliamentary committees are having an impact on federal law. It's generally rights enhancing in nature, so I think this is an area for investment if we care about rights protection. Big star here, this is not enough for people who want Australian lawmaking to adhere to international human rights standards, but we should care about this and celebrate it and talk about it in a positive way. Um, and particularly people that advocate for improved protection of rights should be looking at this space. The other finding is that different committees in the system have different impacts, but it's when they work together that we see the best impact. So this to me suggests multiple committee scrutiny is good. It might seem like a waste of resources, but actually it's really important. Um, and particularly when it's a committee with different attributes, the idea of being open and deliberative, the idea of being technical um, and, and scrutiny focused. Um, also, parliamentary committees create an important opportunity for us to think about what our democracy should look like in the future because they enable us to experiment with direct democracy techniques like surveys or citizens' juries, but they protect us from the potential negative consequences of those models because they create a conduit environment for deliberation. So if we think about marriage equality, we ask the people, is this a good idea, yes or no? Everyone votes, it's binary, it's potentially majoritarian rule. So on the one hand, great, everyone's involved, on the other hand, scary. The parliamentary committee can take that information, take it seriously, reflect on that, complement it with expert information and an emphasis on lived experience and start to develop a response that might um, ensure that we've got a democratic but also deliberative um, approach to lawmaking. And the issue about the right scrutiny culture that I've mentioned before. So um, in the paper on page 21, I've tried to take those big ideas and put them into something practical for example, you know, how might you get the timing of a scrutiny committee's alert digest or digest report right to enable it to have the biggest impact for an inquiry committee? Or things like how might you advertise your parliamentary committee inquiry in a way to improve diversity among stakeholders? Or how might you involve secondees um, to help create that safe space um, for members to workshop alternatives outside of the public gaze. There's some ideas like that in the paper. I think lawyers should care about this too because administrative lawyers and public lawyers are in the business of holding executive to account and this approach of parliamentary scrutiny is a forum for doing that. And it definitely reflects this idea of parliamentary sovereignty. So most of the changes that come about in the laws I've looked at that can be attributed to committee work are changes that are saying, no executive, you will not have the final say on the scope of this power. We will move it over here to the parliament. And this is really important part of our democracy and a bill of rights or a charter of rights can't do that. But the committee system does. And so this is something to celebrate and explain to people. Explain to young people about why they might care about this. 
because the person that refuses their application at Centrelink or um, their visa application or at the state level, their housing application, that decision maker being in the executive branch, should their decision um, be subject to a broader concept of oversight that allows us to talk about ideas that resonate across the political divide about things like fairness and procedural fairness. More and more, the right to be heard in the process of lawmaking is central and parliamentary committees provide that as well, which supplements the administrative idea, lawyer's idea of procedural fairness. Um, so when we're evaluating committees, we should pay particular attention to these things, um, their deliberative capacity, their political characteristics, their relationship with the executive, whether they're involved in policy scrutiny or technical scrutiny, and how they might fit together as a system, as well as the timing of their committee reports. And these themes are connected to recommendations in the paper. These same things are what makes the Australian federal parliamentary system so interesting to the rest of Australia and to the rest of the world because these are quite unique features of the federal system. And these are the exciting features that I think we can use to improve that democratic conversation. And this is really where I wanna to turn to now in the last couple of minutes. How am I going for time, Tony? I'm nearly at one. I've got about another 10 minutes. Okay, great. Um, so the deliberative um, idea is that we create a space for people to participate in a conversation about what the law might be. And we um, actively anticipate that on the basis of hearing evidence, some people might change their mind. Okay, that's the hard part of deliberation. And there's a whole body of theory um, around this um, that I'm not gonna do justice to in these slides. But I just want to point out how important I think parliamentary committees are in this space um, because they're the only part of our parliamentary system at the moment that really is signalling to the community, this is your place to be part of this conversation. They're also so important to parliamentarians. So when I interviewed a whole lot of parliamentarians from across different um, political parties, all of them, even the people that I thought I didn't like, um, said how much this process is important to them and their identity as a parliamentarian, that they want to use the committee system to learn and engage with the, with the community. Now, of course, cynically, we might say, oh yes, they would say that and then they go ahead and do whatever the party room says or they do something to advance their career or it's part of a political trade-off. But the fact that they share that commitment surely is an opportunity for us to build on that idea and to think about this as a place of investment for um, deliberative forums. And my work with the International Parliamentary Engagement Network suggests that it's not an option, we must look to engage the community in a different way. Because if the parliament doesn't, the politics will and the parliament loses the opportunity to harness this community um, uh, evidence in its lawmaking process. And it becomes um, a politicised binary kind of conversation. So this is an important moment for us, an important moment in history um, for us to think about what we're going to do about this issue of declining trust in democratic institutions and I think all of us can do something really positive. And there are many examples of what you're doing brilliantly already when it comes to engagement. So um, just to check that you understand what I mean with engagement, the idea of the parliament engaging with the people is often a thought of linear or conventionally thought of as linear. So the parliamentarian, the elected representative has a mandate they go about delivering that mandate through their representative capacity, involved in the passage of a law or oppose the passage of a law, they tell their constituent. Constituent exercises their democratic right at the next election. This is the kind of thing we're all familiar with. 
Or sometimes we look at it in reverse. The citizen or the community says, I demand a better approach to something like sexual harassment, discrimination. This is what we want you to do. We might have a petition and the parliament responds in some way. But actually the concept of parliamentary engagement is much more complex than that and a circular process. And if we want to reach the people that we're not reaching now, we really have to understand that. And that is that if you don't have information about the institution, if you don't understand what the institution's doing, you can't identify the places at which you're going to be part of that conversation. And so then you can't participate. And once you participate, you're looking for some kind of intervention or outcome and you need to be told about that as well. So this experience um, of engagement from the point of view uh, from the public has these different components to it, which is why when we're looking to improve the diversity or participation rate in a com committee, I think it's completely unrealistic and unfair to the committee staff to say, oh, well, next time we're going for a target of 50% more people or next time we want to see more Aboriginal people participate or more low-income people participate. That would be unrealistic if we haven't also scaffolded that with the type of information that would be needed to start explaining to those people um, what the parliament is doing so that they have an understanding of how they might contribute to that um, idea and so that they feel that it's a legitimate process from their end. So what tools might we think about to help address some of those aspects of public engagement? Um, I'm sure you're well aware of these and there's many examples of best practice from this parliament. So I'd say if you're currently working in this parliament, please keep doing what you're doing because the rest of the world thinks your work's great the rest of the country thinks your work's great. You might feel under-resourced and I'll be the first to champion more resources for you, but other Australian jurisdictions consider you to have Rolls-Royce resources. So you must keep showing your work to inspire others. In South Australia, for example, we have one person that is responsible, part-time person, for all of these aspects of the engagement experience. And so demonstrating the value of your work through evaluation will help those smaller jurisdictions to improve. At the international level, they have tools that they want to share with Australia and they want to learn from the great things that you're doing here. So um, how can we get more resources for public engagement? How can we celebrate success? How can we improve our practice? Well, really we have to evaluate it, which is the whole point of this lecture, to think about how we might evaluate it. So we can turn around and say, this is where we should invest. These are the people we should employ. This is a legitimate task. And I think academia, who often kind of come forward and have these lofty ideas that aren't practical, could actually help with the evaluation. So once the things are clear that you want to achieve, that's when research from academia can help you put that together into something that allows you to talk to the rest of your colleagues about the value of this. It's the same for the community sector. Thinking about what the objectives are from engaging with parliament in a slightly broader way so that you're able to say to your members, it wasn't just that we had a win because we got the law changed or it wasn't a failure because that didn't happen. Actually, part of what we did was connect our members to this democratic institution, which is inherently valuable. Um, so if we can capture some of this, I think we can tell a stronger story, get more resources for this area of engagement. Websites is obviously one of the tools, um, but we have to think about what parts of the website are doing what. Um, so what parts are linear? what parts are going to be interactive. Um, 
And how do we check that what we're doing is reaching people who have previously been excluded? And really the only way is to ask them and to try new things. And I can see that that's what the parliament is doing. Um, but if you have to have legal qualifications or experience in parliamentary procedure to find things, that's obviously going to limit the reach. And that has actually been the experience until very, very recently. So that is an issue. Um, how can we get the community to participate? We have to explain what the institution's doing in a way that they'll understand and we can see some excellent work coming out of this parliament on that. Um, another example of this is what's happening in the UK with this public reading stage of a bill where we're able to draw together a lot of different bits of information about a piece of legislation and allow um, members of the public to kind of interact really quickly and directly with the text of the bill. This isn't going to work for everyone, but it's a little signal that people care about what the public thinks. And it's also nice and direct, and it don't have to wait for a parliamentary committee hearing before we can have this kind of engagement, which can help us with those timing problems that often come up. If someone has a positive experience by engaging with this, and we close that feedback loop by telling them what happened, this can really encourage them to participate again. It can also be handy for peak bodies to try and get um, a more inclusive approach to what their members think on individual law. School visits, sounds obvious. Again, something this parliament's brilliant at. But we should be more ambitious about what the students get out of it because these students have something to say about the content of the law that's being debated in this place. And when we ask them what they think, even if it's a complex piece of legislation about taxation um, or anything like that that we think it might be too complex for students, if we take the time to explain it in a way that resonates with them, we will get rich information back from them. And these are people that are already here, that we've already told them what the institution's about. And when there's examples of parliaments asking students, it has a flow on effect to their families. Um, and we can create new ideas about how we might want to engage with young people. Um, and they will have a positive experience that they'll share to others. Partnerships with host organisations, particularly for, for groups that have been historically excluded, this is really important. Creating safe spaces for people to participate in the work of committees by, instead of asking everyone to come in here, um, replicate our culture, our language, our dress, our formality, we will use a host organisation where people feel comfortable and we will be listeners instead of leaders in that discussion. Um, obviously, this is resource intensive, but perhaps not much more resource intensive than having to wade through a whole lot of disparate submissions that pull against what you really want to find. If you work with a host organisation, you can target your input you can also address timing issues because you can sort it out really quickly um, with a host organisation and get them to do some of the work for you. Um, social media, pretty obvious. Um, we've seen this with the COVID-19 committee, really, really fascinating. So immediately getting diversity of participation, participation rates really, really high, even though legislative impact might not be so strong with that committee. And it had a lot to do with social media and it had a lot to do with the fact that the chair of that committee, Katie Gallagher, put her face on everything. And that's what people want to see. They want to see the committee member's face um, and they can engage um, through social media. Now, the problem is, do you end up getting quality or not? Well, this depends on your perspective. Um, so sometimes you might say, you end up getting all of this <coughs> crappy stuff from social media, what do we do with that? On the other hand, um, doing nothing on social media is also a problem because you're preferencing the people that write in a way that all of us find more acceptable. 
So we have to challenge ourselves to think about what counts as quality and perhaps the person who does a quick like or click is the one with lived experience and even though their social media post might not be valuable, it might tell us that we need to go and spend more time thinking about that cohort. Maybe we do need to reach out to a peak body that represents them or maybe we need to explain what we're looking for in a different way to avoid this misunderstanding of the issue that might come through from the social media. There's tools in the UK around how you might quickly collate information on social media through digital um, kind of uh, scanning of um, social media posts. That's the type of thing I'd love to talk to you about in more detail if you're working in that space. Facebook posts, uh, forums, uh, another one, um, again, you know, if you've got a, a person in there, it makes a big difference. Um, also, citizen-led data collection on issues can be really great. And so we have many examples of this in the bushfire recovery experience at the state level, where people are going out there doing something active to collect information back to the parliament. They feel valued because they're doing. And it's not just about talking about law, it's doing something like taking a photo of their environment. And it's a really powerful way to connect people into the parliament. Um, there's also this exciting software. And really, um, I'm not trying to sell you any software. I think many of these things can be done without any new investment in technology. But these two pieces of software, InfoLeg being used in Brazil and Liquid Feedback in Germany, take the moderator out of the experience, which is really interesting. So it means that the individual um, uh, member of the public can participate and follow what's happening without some committee process moderating that. So liquid feedback allows kind of a citizen's jury type approach to solving a problem without a moderator. I can explain that more if you're interested. Um, of course, there's challenges when we think about engagement, all of these things that you know well, and I'll try and finish up soon. Um, you know, resources are, are very important. Um, but this idea of connections between parliamentary services, I did want to draw to your attention because I think the person that's leading the school tour and the person who's working in the library on the Bill's Digest and the person that's supporting the committee chair have to talk to each other because they're all part of that engagement journey and they all have the opportunity to improve the quality and output of each other's work. Um, and we have to choose the right tool depending on these things. Um, and how do we know what the right tool is? Well, we can learn from international practice, but we can better off to learn from our own practice by evaluating and sharing results. And again, that's where academia can help because we might be able to document what you're busy doing so that it can be shared with another part of this parliament or another Australian parliament. Um, we have to assess engagement because if we don't, no one cares about it. If we do, we start to see our strengths and weaknesses. But we have to think about what are we assessing and why are we assessing it? So if we're assessing it on the basis of what's cheaper or what might have a bigger legislative impact um, or what might result in more diversity, we have to be careful that we're not missing those other things like the experience of legitimacy. So um, sometimes going big is not what you want. You want something meaningful for a smaller group of people. And so um, in the paper, there's some ideas about how you might set up an evaluation for a particular engagement strategy um, and you know how we might think about whether it was effective or not. Um, I think I've talked about this, so I'm going to move through a couple of these. Um, to get to this conference that happened in March, a um, couple of weeks ago, some of you were involved, um, an international conference on public engagement. And the Australian discussion landed here. It, well, the people involved in this discussion were parliamentary staff and academics from all around the world, Australia, then Europe, and then the Americas. And there was some things that came out of it that were common. The first is that parliamentary public engagement is not an option. It's a necessity for modern democracies. It's be going to become more important. 
we think about engagement, we want quality and openness for change rather than the idea of asking everyone all the time. We need to understand there's not just one public, especially there's not just a public that looks like us and that the publics out there want control over their experience and that's what we see with the Uluru Statement and The Voice. So listening to how people want to engage and loosening our own control over that is hard, but that is the challenge ahead for us. Um, if we evaluate engagement strategies looking beyond immediate success or failure, we'll get a better picture. And if we don't change what we're doing now, we won't reach the people that we have to reach. Um, so none of this is easy, but it's a challenge I think we should embrace together. Um, and the International Parliamentary Engagement Network has developed a toolkit for this now, interactive toolkit, that could be a starting point to take away to your NGO or your department or your parliamentary services team um, to talk about how that might be reflected in your own workplace, in your KPIs or in your annual reporting and, and or your advocacy strategy. Um, and so I think I'll just leave it there. Sorry about this slide not being very clear. Um, sorry I've gone over time too. Again, thank you for what you're doing. You're making a difference. <coughs> I'm interested. People in um, the other jurisdictions in Australia are interested and people in the world are interested in what you're doing. Um, and if there's ways you can think of integrating research into your practice, I'd absolutely love to hear about them and try and make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I think we do have time for one question. So it would be wonderful if someone um, would like to claim that question. There is a microphone here. Lovely. And there is a microphone behind you. Would you mind using the microphone? Just that allows our, um, our audience online to also hear your question. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Good afternoon. And thank you very much for your uh, very interesting talk this afternoon. Um, I guess my question relates to um, the generally perceived role of committees as a scrutiny or information gathering um, body and, and the effectiveness they have in engagement that way. My interest would be in what you think about uh, the role of uh, chairs of certain committees. And the one that concerned me recently was when, uh, I think it's the Standing Committee on Economics, was used for party political purposes and uh, prior to the last election. And, and it broke so many parliamentary con conventions in doing that. And I'm just wondering, is there not a role for, for Parliament in shutting down those sorts of things before they get going? Yeah, thanks. That's an excellent um, question. And I worked for the Law Council for nearly 10 years and I definitely have distinct memories of appearing before parliamentary committees where it was obvious what was happening and that was a political kind of staging and nothing to do with the actual task of accountability or scrutiny. Um, so I think that is an issue and I think the role of the chair is absolutely key for creating the culture of the committee. Um, but I think the techniques around improving diversity of engagement will um, help ameliorate that possibility. So how can we get the executive out of parliamentary committees? We just can't. And the intelligence and security example shows that maybe we don't want to because um, sometimes creating a space for people to have these kind of um, manifestations of their political um, position is important for our democracy um, because we have a reaction to that that might change the discourse in the future if it's negative. Um, but I think the exciting thing for me is when you change the diversity of the type of people who are involved in committees, you give a reason for different MPs to be involved and so then you change the dynamic and the quality of that committee. Um, and the chair's role is central and the expectations we should have from the chair, I think I totally agree with you, need to be elevated. 
Um, and the chairs that do things well need to be celebrated, the chairs that go out of the parliament. And as soon as you go out of the parliament and try that on, um, you have a, a visceral community reaction to that. And I think that's part of what some of these strategies do. But I, I think particularly on estimates, that's going to be an ongoing challenge. Um, but each time you get a new committee member that comes in with this goal of trying to give effect to those shared values of accountability and engagement with the community, you have hope to change that culture. Um, so if we can give them a reason to actively be involved and celebrate it, um, then I think that might be one way of helping. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm sorry that we are out of time for further questions. So thank you for joining us online and here in person. Uh, Sarah's lecture will be available on our website uh, very shortly. So um, it's now uh, my pleasure to um, ask you to join with me in thanking Dr Bolts.